Let me get right into, um, right into what we're in the middle of a series just called Fellowship. And uh, what I'm talking about is what, is it, what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus? And the word fellowship is really not a word that you'd find in a dictionary. It's a combination of two words, what it means to be a follower and the word discipleship. And really what I'm trying to do, to do is to address two groups of people in this room today because there are some people here that are brand new followers of Jesus who have just made a decision to follow Jesus in the last few months or the last year of your life and you're new to this. And what does it mean to be a follower? What does it mean to be a disciple? Disciple. And then there's another group of people that I want to talk to that are that I can relate to. And those are people that have been serving God for a lot of years, for many years. But we deal with something called spiritual drift. And um, you don't even you don't even mean to do this, but you slowly drift away. It's like a slow leak in a tire, and and you find yourself further away from God than what you wanted to be. And Jesus dealt with this. He said, To be my follower. And, and I want to unpack that thought for you. Our text for this verse, for this series rather, has been this verse right here. It's real simple. It's in John 17. Jesus said, I'm not asking that you take them out of the world, but that you guard them from the evil one. And like what we know right now is the world is a mess, that the world's way is not working. And so for a lot of Christians, we're like, Come, Lord Jesus, come. But can I tell you something? I mean, although that's going to be a great day, that was never his plan to come back for a defeated, frightened church. He wanted to come back for a glorious, overcoming church. And so the goal isn't to take us out of the world, but he said, hey, by the way, they are no more defined by the world than I am defined by the world. What I want to tell you is this. There are thousands of voices in the world that are trying to define you right now. There are thousands of influences that are trying to define you, whether it's social media, whether it's at the workplace, whether it's, you know, news media, entertainment. And can I tell you something? The loudest voice in your life can't be the world. The loudest voice in your life has to be the voice of God. Right, if you're going to feed on anything, feed on Scripture. And so we're talk, we're kind of unpack this thought, what it means to be defined by the world. And what we have done is we've gone a step further and said, okay, what does it mean to be a follower? Now I want to warn you, this series is going to end next week. It's a five part series, and I wrote this specifically to move people, so you'd become a better version of yourself. I wrote this specifically to challenge people in their walk with God. And I'm going to start off with a, a strong, strong statement, and it's. Jesus said this, he never said to attend me, he said to follow me. And I think there's a crisis in our nation right now. There's a crisis in our nation that we have churches that are full of attenders and not followers. We have people that go to church, and that's great, trust me, I'm a pastor, I'm glad you're here. But, but it's not just that, he said, he didn't say, I'm going to build my church so you can attend it, he said, no, I'm going to build my church so you can follow me. And I'm, gonna, I'm just going to shoot straight. I think the greatest need in our church isn't for, you know, different politicians, for new parties to rise. I think the greatest need in our nation today is for the church to rise up. The answer is Jesus. It always has been. Can you imagine, like, like and what's happening is in our churches today, we have a lot of attenders, and, and, and a lot of us think that really when we raise our hand in church and get saved, that's the end. Can I tell you something? That's only the beginning. That was never meant to be the end. It was only meant to be the beginning. It's almost like, you know, we have a lot of people attending that are still babies. You know, and can you imagine if a nation, and they gave birth to all these hundreds of thousands of babies, but the babies never grew up. How many know that nation would not survive? The nation would not make it. They were, they, they went, little babies can't, can't run an economy. Little babies can't lead. Little babies, all they can do is take and other people take care of them. I was uh, flying home on a flight this, uh, this week, in the middle of the week, I was coming back, I think I was on a Wednesday, and, um, and it was a long flight, it was uh, about a four and a half hour flight out west, and, and if you've been flying lately, you know every seat's taken on every flight, it's kind of crazy, and, um, and so I was actually on this flight, and they announced before I got on there, you know, it's going to be a full flight, every seat's taken, so I went and sat in my seat, I got there a little early, and, and so, and no one's sitting beside me, and, and no one's sitting beside me, and all of a sudden they're dinging the bell like we're ready to go, and I'm like, oh, praise the Lord, I start praying, thank you, Jesus, I love you, Lord, and... Um, <laughs> Two empty seats, and lo and behold, here comes two people down the last two people, and guess where they sit? Plop right beside me. 
And, um, and so I'm sitting there and, and actually we're taking off and we get up settled and I like to, I'm a reader and, and, um, and I do some work on the plane. And so, and so the internet's not working on the plane. It's a long flight and, and I'd been pretty busy on this trip. So I just thought I'd just chill out. So I got my iPad out and, and um, what I like to do, especially when I don't have one of the kids with me is, is I like, I keep my iPad for a lot of reasons, but one of the things on there is there's a lot of photos of the family on there and I miss them, you know, I'll keep it and I'll look through it. So I had some extra time to go back and look and I went back to a section on the phone album. Dina put some on there for me. And it was when Caleb, our nine-year-old, was born. And I was looking through pictures in, in the um, hospital of when he was born. And, and he had his little, he was, of course, an infant. And then, and then he had his two-year-old sister, Olivia, and a five-year-old, Julia, and an 11-year-old, um, uh, John Mark, and 13-year-old, Natalie. And they were all in this picture. I'm kind of going through it. And I noticed this lady beside me. She's kind of like, I'm like, ah. Oh, and I hear her go, ah. Oh. And she's kind of watching with me. And I'm ooing, and she's all and um, so I, was, I didn't bother me a bit. I'm like, these are good looking kids. You know, I made them. And, um, and so, so, so we're going through them all and, and then we kept going through and the family's just getting a little bit older and we're just kind of, I just kind of got a couple hours going through pictures for years and she's with me and, and she's looking at it and she looks at me and I can almost hear her think, how can you be so old and have that young, many young kids? And so I looked at her and I said, oh, they're not that age anymore. This is a nine, these are nine-year-old photos. She goes, wow, I was gonna say, if you're that old and you have that many kids, this is gonna be, you're in trouble. <laughs> and the goal, listen, the goal of having kids is not to just have kids. The goal is to move them along, to make them better versions of themselves. And I, I fear that we've measured success in the church today by attendance rather than disciples. How many can we get to come versus how many are we growing? Jesus said, it's not about attending me, it's about following me. I've told you this before. You're gonna be in one of four places. You could be seeking. And if you're here today and you're seeking, I'm, I'm just honored that you would come. I, I, I mean it. I prayed for you this morning. I prayed for you this week. Uh, if you're seeking where this is right for you, whether to follow Jesus or not. Take your time, make your decision. What I know is if you don't make the decision today, you'll be back because there's no other way. There's nothing else that'll make you satisfied other than following Jesus. But then once you make that decision from seeking, you go into a relationship. And that's where a lot of Christians are stuck. I have a relationship. I began a relationship with Jesus. But Jesus takes us beyond a relationship to discipleship. And, and that's where we're growing. So we, and our, our church is built around that. We want to grow you in your walk with the Lord. Ultimately, the goal is that you have lordship. That, you, that Jesus is, he becomes the Lord of your life. What I want to do is I want to talk to you today about becoming the best version of yourself. I want to talk to you today about something that I live my life. This is how I pastor from this statement. That I want you to get to heaven and have no regret. I'm going to title this message, if you're looking for a title, it's simply going to be Great in the Kingdom. What does it mean to be great? What does the Bible define as greatness? Because the world is going to define greatness for you. What I know is this, the world will define greatness, and they'll say, well, you're great if you, you're great if you have power. Like if you, they, they'll say, you're great if you have a lot of power, if you're in a position of authority, and you can get people to do what you want. Or they would say, if you have position, if you finally have position, if you have risen in the ranks, and you're the CEO of a company, or you're an owner of a company, and if you have, you have position, then you really, you're great. Or they'd say this, if you have pay, if you make good money and if you, if you got good, a lot of money in the bank and, and you got a lot of bucks coming in, then you're going to be great. And ultimately they'll say, man, it's prestige. If you have prestige, then you're great. If people know you're something, if people look up to you and people want to emulate you and, and you have all the, and you're well known. And, and really this is what the world defines as, as greatness. But what did Jesus define as greatness? I want to unpack that for you. To do that, I want to take you to a story that's found in the book of Mark. In Mark chapter 10, and I'm going to have it for you up on the screen. And let me set this up for you. Jesus had a, a team, and he had 12 disciples. And what the scripture clearly, clearly tells us is not only did he have those 12 disciples, but he even had others that kind of helped on his team that were on the crusade team and treasurers and all that sort of thing. He had a, little, he had a small, small little group that worked with him. And, but the main were the 12. And it says, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came over and spoke to him. So let me set this up. 12 then the two get Jesus apart, and they're by himself. And James and John, they came over, and they said, teacher... 
we want you to do us a favor. So Jesus said, okay, what is it? What is your request? And they replied, when you sit on your glorious throne, we want to sit in places of honor next to you, one on your right and the other on your left, which, which really honestly, there is, we think of a glorious throne. It's not the glorious throne they were thinking of. We think about a throne in heaven, sitting, sitting at the right hand of the Father. That's not the throne they were talking about because in their mind, Jesus was coming to overthrow the Roman uh, uh, government and, and, and the oppression, and they thought he was gonna form a new government where Jesus was gonna be king. And by the way, he is king. He just now is king of kings. And um, he said, and they, they said, well, he, you're gonna become king. You're gonna get... Israel is going to become the nation of the world, like a superpower, and we want to be the vice president. We want to be the secretary of defense. We want to be your right-hand people. Verse 41, but when the other 10 disciples heard this, what James and John had asked, they were indignant. They were ticked off. They were like, man, who do you guys think you are? So Jesus said, okay, everybody, come here. Get together. Let's talk about this. He called them together, and he said, you know that the rulers... In this world, like if you're in a position of authority in this world, you lord it over people. If you have prestige, if you have power, if you have position, if you have money, you lord it over people. In officials, they flaunt their authority over those under them. Come on, doesn't this describe like the world system right now? If you can get up, then you're gonna be okay. Verse 43, but Jesus said you are to lead Man, it's going to be a different model for you guys. If you want to be the greatest, he says, okay, now think about this. These are the words of the master. These are the words of Jesus. He said, if you want to be the greatest, I purposely didn't put it on the slide because I want you to fill in the blank. Like, what would it be to be the greatest? When you think about the greatest, is it someone who has a lot of authority? Someone has a big platform, someone that has a big audience, someone that has a lot of money, someone that's, that, 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 that the world looks up to, prestige. He said, if you want to be the greatest, this is the model that I want you to live by. Then live as one called to serve others. Now, why did Jesus have to talk about this? I'll tell you why. Because it's not going to come natural to you. You're not going to want to do this. This is going to be the opposite of what the world's going to tell you. No, become great so others can serve you. Jesus said, no, serve others and become great. The path to promotion comes by having the heart of a bond slave who serves everyone. He said, for even the son of man did not come expecting to be served by everyone, but to serve everyone and to give his life as the ransom price for the salvation of many. This is the opposite of what the world says, to which I'm going to tell you, here's what Jesus is basically saying, a great quote. I don't know who wrote this, but I, it's unknown. If serving is beneath you, leadership is beyond you. He's talking about having the heart of a servant. See, great in Jesus' eyes is not to go up, but to go down. Not to become great, but to serve. And I don't honestly think that about East Coast Believer Church. I, I work with a lot of churches and pastors, and a lot of pastors, they pray this way, Lord, give us, Lord, give us our city. Lord, give our city to us. And can I tell you something? I think that's the wrong prayer. I think the prayer is not give us our city. See, the city's not a gift to East Coast Believers Church. Can I tell you something? East Coast Believers Church, we're meant to be a gift to the city. It's not the city exists for us. We exist for them. That's why this Saturday is Love Our City. That's why this Saturday we're going to go out and teams of people are going to go out in three, a three-hour shift, and we're going to go out and love on our city. You know why? We're going to model for them what Christian leadership is all about. Can I get a good amen, everybody? Let me, let me take you. I want to go a step further, and I want to take you to a New Testament story. I want to take you to a story that's a parable, one, probably at least the second or third most famous parable that Jesus told. And it's the parable of the Good Samaritan. And I want to illustrate, I want to use his story to illustrate a thought for you. It says in uh, John chapter 13, verse 1, before the, pa this is not the parable, excuse me, I'll go to that in a moment. Before the Passover celebration, celebration, Jesus knew that his hour had come to leave this world and return to his father. Now let me set this up for you. We're getting ready to go to a party. 
And it's gonna be a, the foot washing ceremony that Jesus is gonna perform. Now let me tell you about this foot washing ceremony. The church, the modern day church has turned this into something that really we should do and model, but let me just throw this out to you. Nowhere else in the entire New Testament is there a foot, another foot washing ceremony. You can go through all the epistles, you can go through Acts, you can go through Roman, Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians. N- n- nowhere else you, will you find in the New Testament a foot washing ceremony. And Because let me just say, a lot of us have taken this as sort of a, this is something we should do in the church. Well, really, Jesus wasn't saying do this exactly because it's not practical, but get the heart of it. Because let me set it up for you, because back in the Bible days, when people would go to a home or to a, especially a party, there'd be somebody there that'd be a foot washer. And he was the lowest of the lowest servants. And now the reason is, is because their feet would be dirty. The reason is, is because their feet would be muddy. The reason is because their feet would be cracked and, and messed up from walking outside in the heat and the dirt and the dust. And they didn't want to bring that dirt inside the home. So here we are. He had loved his disciples during his ministry on earth, and now he loved them to the very end. And it was time for supper, and the devil had already prompted Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to portray Jesus. So I need to set this up for you. What you're getting ready to see is Jesus, think about incredible humility. He's getting ready to wash the feet of the one who's going to portray him. Think about that. Think about how much humility it takes. So in verse four, it says, so he got up from the mill, he took off his outer robe, it took a towel and wrapped it around his waist. Now think about that because when you think about just the outer robe, we oftentimes overlook what that even means. But see, back in those days when someone wore a robe, a teacher in particular, it signified that he had followers. It signified, it was a, he wore a robe and it identified him as being somebody important. It's kind of like when you see these generals on television giving updates about war, what's going on in Afghanistan. You see all those, you see all those colors on their sleeve and all the stars on their, on their shoulders. It signifies something. It signifies that they've done something and they've been faithful and they're important. Well, this robe that Jesus is wearing, it signified that he was a teacher. He was a rabbi. He got up and he said, hey, I'm going to take this position of authority off for a minute. And he took a towel, which is the, the, the uh, uh, a towel of a servant, wrapped it around his waist. And then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' dirty feet and dry them with a towel. After washing their feet, he put his robe back on. It wasn't like he said, I'm I'm never going to put that on again. He put it back on and returned to his place at the table. He said, did you, do you understand what I just did? Like, do you, do you comprehend what just happened here? And he's going to explain it to them. Jesus said, you've called me your teacher and Lord and you're right. That's who I am. Like, I'm, I, he's saying, this applies if you're a president, if you're a CEO, if you're the leader of a home, if you're a teacher in a classroom, you have your position of authority. And that's right. And it's rightful, you, you're supposed to stay there. But if I'm your teacher and Lord, and I've just washed your dirty feet, then you should, here it is, followers, follow the example that I've set for you. And wash one another's dirty feet. Now do for each other what I have just done for you. Why did he say that? Here's why. You're not going to want to do this. It won't come natural to you. It's not part of your human nature. Your human nature is to go up so others can serve you. Jesus said, no leaders, we go down so we can serve others. Verse 17, he said, so now put into practice what I have done for you and you will experience One of the benefits of this, a life of happiness enriched with untold blessings. In the Greek, this says, your soul will be filled with happiness. Come on, if there's anything that our nation needs right now, it's for people to be happy. And Jesus has told us how to get your soul filled with happiness, and that is by using your life to make a difference in the lives of other people. I have a dear friend, and um, he attends our church, but really lives, has multiple homes, and and, um, and so... uh, 
And he's a, it was a exec, he was the executive of a large organization and in which you would describe him as, most people here would describe him as uh, an American success story. He started off at the bottom of a company and rose up to the highest of high levels and ran a multinational uh, company. If I called it out, most of you would all know the name of this company and um, just became very successful at it and traveled around the world and sat in boardrooms and board meetings. In fact, even today, sits on boards of large co- corporations and organizations and, and so whenever I have an issue or a challenge business-wise, I would call this person because he's a lot of experience and a lot of wisdom and, and has a track record, a proven track record. And so, um, so uh, he actually decided to go on a trip with our, our church, a missions trip to Guatemala. Our children's home was down there, and this team that was going down about 10 or 12 or 15 people went and on this trip, and they were going to go down, and they were going to serve in our orphanage. And what they were going to do in our children's home down there was do some painting and do some cleaning and, and, and work with the kids and have fun with the kids, give our staff down there a break a little bit. And so he went down there, and, um, and he brought himself and a couple of his kids, with, grandkids with him. And, and, so, um, and so when he got down there, he's, he's cleaning and painting and all that. And he's a business mind. I would think this way too, so I'm not faulting him. He's sitting there, he's thinking to himself, well, I I don't understand. I spent, and I'm not. I'm gonna fill in the blank. A number. I'm gonna say seven or eight thousand dollars to get his all, all his kids down there. Uh, probably about fifteen hundred hundred dollars each or so. And and he goes, I think it would be better instead of me paying money to come down here because he's he's about a, he's the results kind of a guy. And, and I would think this way too. He said, Why don't instead of me spending all this money, taking time out of my schedule? why don't we just hire a Guatemalan to do this? Like, it can't be that expensive to paint these walls. It can't be $8,000. And why don't we just hire more people? And so he was thinking about, he was gonna call me and say, I think it's a, not a good use of our time for me to spend all this money to come down here and just do this, which a Guatemalan could do. He said about the third day, he was down there. He'd been painting that morning or doing some work that morning in the, in the home and he went out and played with some of the kids and he went and sat on a wall and all of a sudden it hit him. He said, I haven't been this fulfilled and I can't think of how many years. He said, I'm the most fulfilled I've ever been. I'm the happiest I've ever been. Can I tell you something? The words of Jesus are true. You serve others and you will experience a life of happiness with, enriched with untold blessings. So let me unpack this in a few minutes I have well up with you. I'm going to come up with four statements that I think would describe because a follower serves. A follower isn't to be served, we serve. And I came up with some thoughts that I think, I think that'll sort of help you put this into practical terms for you. What does God say about serving? What is God's thought? What is God's heart on this? Number one, God puts service over position. See, in, in, in our world, in America, in our culture, we put position over service. But can I tell you something? God puts uh, service over position. We say, well, I am, you can fill in the blank, I am doctor, I am a CEO, I am the leader of my home, therefore you serve. And can I tell you something? That's never the heart of God. It's really, position is not important as, as important to God as service is whether you serve other people or not. In fact, this is something I do. I read this in a book probably a decade ago, and, and, and I put this into practice in our church. Whenever I hire, I don't hire all of our staff, but I'm always involved in hiring what I call our high-level staff, our pastoral staff, our executive team. I get involved in that process. And, um, and whenever they finally go through the process and the team says, this is who we want to hire, I say, okay. And so I get, I'm going to go spend an evening with them. And so what I do is, and I ask them to come down with their family and bring their family down. We'll pay for it. And, um, and, um, and, and, and their kids. And we always go to a restaurant. And I always find a restaurant that's going to be really busy. I always find a restaurant that's going to have a waiting line. I always find a restaurant that's really going to, not, not probably going to be the most easy experience for you. And then what I do is this. It's completely intentional. I'm not even going to tell you what restaurant I choose because if I do, you're going to know the worst restaurant in, in Winter Springs. And, um, and so, but, if, but when we do that, what I'm doing is this. We're going to sit down and we're going to talk. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to watch how they treat that server. I'm going to watch how they talk to that hostess. 
I'm going to watch how they talk to their spouse, to their husband, or to their wife, how they treat their kids. I don't care how you treat me. I know how you're going to treat me. I already know that. But how do you treat others? That's what's important. Can I tell you, I think Jesus does the same thing. He puts service as a higher, he said, hey, I don't need you to go up, I need you to go down. Here's here's the verse, Philippians chapter two, he says, don't be selfish, don't try to impress others. Isn't, Isn't this described like where our nation is today? I was just reading recently about the fastest growing companies in America, and of course you would know this, that social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, they've just blown up out of the middle of nowhere. It's a phenomenon. They can't even understand how a company could go from zero value to the billions of dollars of value that they have in such a short amount of time. You want to know why? We are, we are a selfish culture that tries to impress others. That's, that, they said this, they said social media wouldn't have worked 50 years ago because it was a different generation. But Jesus said, be humble. Think of others, I'm scary, Paul said, be, think, be humble, think of others as better than yourself. Can I tell you something? To have a heart of a servant, you have to be humble. He said, don't look out only for your own interest, but take an interest in others too. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Number two, I'd say this. Do what is right, not what is convenient. Can I tell you something? Serving is not convenient. Can I tell you something? There are people right now that came to first service and they're right now working with kids. Can I tell you something? It wasn't a convenient morning for them. There's somebody right now that's changing a diaper in a nursery. It's not convenient. There's somebody out there right now that are walking through our parking lot security team that are making sure your cars are taken care of. Can I tell you it's not convenient? They'd rather be sitting here. But what I will tell you is this, to to do anything that has any... Uh, eternal consequence is going to require earthly sacrifice. Because you have to do what is right, not convenient. I mean, think about it. Think about like, like I have kids and what if t- tomorrow morning I go to my son, my nine-year-old and said, hey, buddy, time to get up, get out of bed. He said, hey, daddy, I don't want to go to school today. I says, why? Because I'm tired. He said, can you do me a favor, dad? Would you call the teacher and can you go to the school and can you get my homework for me? Bring it home and lay it out for me. And when I wake up, I'll come downstairs and I'll do it. Can I tell you something what would happen in our home if, that, if I had that conversation with my nine-year-old? <laughs> I'd be ripping those blanks. Can I tell you something? It's not, a, it's not, it's not always convenient to serve. We, we live in a culture of convenience. One of my kids is on a football team, and, and, man, they, and honestly, things didn't work out great for this season for them, and, 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 and sort, of, sort of a lot of things that I don't even agree with that have happened on his team, and he came to me and said, I'm going to quit. I said, let's have a conversation about this. And honestly, the things that he sees, I see, I agree with him, and it's not fair. Now, let me back up for you and tell you why he wants to quit, because when he started playing football years ago, the first three or four teams that he ever got on, they were essentially undefeated and they were champions every year. And as Dean and everyone's chat, shouting and holding up trophies, I'm thinking, uh-oh, uh-oh, this isn't good. He's gonna think at six years old that every team he's on is champions. And not every team you're gonna be on is gonna be a championship. What I, what I was thinking back then, coach, help me out here. What I was thinking back then, that early success was going to cost him in the future if he wasn't careful. Yeah. And he got on a team that's zero wins right now and says, hey, I want to quit. What do you do? You have to remind him, you, you can't quit on your team. Being on a team is not always convenient, but sticking with it is Right? Let me, let me unpack this a little bit further with the parable I was going to tell you a moment ago. This is the parable of the Good Samaritan. Jesus in Luke chapter 10, they asked him a question and he answered it by telling the story that we know is the parable of the Good Samaritan. He said, there was once a man traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho. On the way, he was attacked by robbers. They took his clothes, beat him up, and went off, leaving him half dead. Luckily, a priest, and, and almost like, it's almost like sarcastic, like luckily... A priest was on his way down the same road, but when he saw him, he angled across to the other side. And then a Levite, a religious man 
showed up, and he also avoided the injured man. Notice this. It, they angled and they avoided. Why? Because it wasn't convenient. Because it wasn't easy. Changing lives sometimes costs something. And sometimes we want to angle ourselves or avoid. When I, I, whenever I take my kids down to a third world nation, almost a lot of the third world nations, like we take our trash and we have a trash cans, that are, our, our trash trucks that come by and pick it up and they deliver it far outside of the city where you don't know about it. Where in a lot of the other third world countries, they'll come by, pick up the trash and they'll bring them to the center of the city and, and they'll have like a garbage dump there. And oftentimes you'll see the poor people, poor, it's hard to watch, you see the poor people rummaging through the garbage trying to get some food or trying to find something of value. And oftentimes you see little kids. And so I had my son with me on one trip. He's probably about 12, 13 years old at the time. And I said, we're going to take a trip and we're going to go. And he's going to go to the garbage dump. And this isn't even one of the bad ones. It's bad, but it's not as bad as some of the other ones. And when you go there, it smells awful. You see things you don't want to see. What is the most difficult thing to see for a 13-year-old is another 13-year-old digging through trash for food. It messes you up. It does something to you. It hurts. What I will tell you is this, you'll go to bed that night thinking about it. Your next meal that you have, you'll think about that little boy digging through food. And we want to avoid all that, but I don't let my kids avoid it because I'm not going to let them angle away from problems. Avoid. And then, verse 33, the Samaritan traveling the road came on him, and when he saw the man's condition, his heart went out to him. He gave him first aid, disaffecting and bandaging his wounds, and he lifted him up on his, onto his donkey, led him into an inn, made him comfortable. In the morning, he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take good care of him. Which we'd say it's obvious, but notice the rest of this. But if it costs any more, because I will tell you something, to change a life, it's going to cost you something. It's just the reality of it. He said, put it on my bill. I'll pay you on my way back. What do you think? Which of the three became a neighbor to the man attacked by the robbers? The one who treated him kindly. The religion scholar responded. Jesus said, go and do the same. Because he's going to, he said, hey, you're going to want to avoid problems. You're going to want to avoid Love Our City. I get it. Three hours on a side. I get it. You're busy. Everyone's busy. You're going to angle away from that. He said, but don't do the same. Let me start wrapping this up. I'm going to give you another thought, but before that, I'm going to give you the verse four. Usually I give you the point in the verse. Now I'm going to give you the verse. James chapter 4 and verse 10 says, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. Let me give you some theology real quick here. It's a popular message out today. Just because something's popular doesn't make it scriptural. Even if I preach something that's, don't take my word for it, see if the Bible says it or not. I always want you to go to the Bible, not to me. But there's a popular thing out there that God will humble you. And can I tell you something? In the New Testament, there's not one single verse that says God will humble you. Now, in the Old Testament, there is verses in there, but they didn't have a heart to God. They had a heart of stone, not a heart of flesh. They didn't have a soft heart that was in tune with the Holy Spirit that would lead them to the right decision. So God would do that for them. But under the New Testament, he says, God's not going to humble you. You have to humble yourself. It's holding the thing, well, God's going to humble. No, no. New Testament, you humble yourself. God's not going to bring you low. You've got to bring yourself low. And can I tell you something? To serve, it's going to require some humility. But I'm going to do it God's way, not my way. Someone says, where do I serve? Where, where do I serve? Number one, your family. Can you imagine how different your family would be if you walked in there and said, I'm going to serve you today? How can I serve you? What can I do for you? How can, how can my life make a difference in your life today? What I'll promise you is this. Go home, husbands, to your wife and say, what can I do to serve you today? And, and after you pick her up off the floor, um, do it. You'll have a better home. Kids, if you went to your home to your parents, they said, what can I do to make your life better in the home? 
serve, serve your family, serve your community. So proud of our outreach team here at East Coast. Tens of thousands of meals go out a year and hundreds of thousands of pounds of food and teams go out and schools are changed and filled up with food and outreach occurs at a level that, and I'm proud of you for paying for it, thank you. But you're making a difference in the lives of people. Ser- serve, your, serve your church. Like if, if your church made you better, then you make it better. Like, like we worship one and we serve one, that's our motto. I'm going to use my life to make a difference. Every team here said, I, they, they're making it, but they'd be a whole lot. I know you think everything's great, we're perfect, and we're getting it, but can I tell you something? Every team would be better if you were on it. It would. Here's what I'm saying. If you just started in these three areas, your family, your community, and your church, it would change everything. So what's our goal? We're, in, we're done now. What's our goal? Our goal is this, and it's, it's pretty simple and it's pretty easy. Culture doesn't say to do this, but this is what a follower does. Not to be great, but to make Jesus great. We, we want to make him great. You know, um, my mom's 88 years old, and um, she, my dad went to heaven last year, 2020. And um, she came and stayed with us. And I mean, the first night she stayed with us, we went for a walk. And man, we just were walking. And she, there was a little piece of a sidewalk that was sticking out. And she tripped on it. And she fell on her elbow. And man, it was awful. And she fell. And, and she laid there. And, 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 and she said, I'm fine. And she got up. And she said, see, I'm fine. I said, I'm taking you to the hospital. It doesn't look fine to me. And she's bleeding. She goes, no, no, I'm good. I'm like, no, no, you're going to the hospital. She says, no, I'm not. And I go, yes, you are. And um, guess what? She went. And... Um, so we went there and they found it was broken in three places. It was awful, you know, it had stitches and all this. And, and uh, man, can I just tell you, it wasn't a pleasant experience in that hospital that night. Not everybody was bad, but there was a couple nurses that, you ever been to a hospital like, like the nurses don't want you there? They don't want to be there and they don't want you there. It's just an awful experience. It's bad enough that your 88-year-old mom is bleeding and broke her elbow in three places and it's not looking good. And then to have all that, it was just awful. Man, it just was an awful experience. But can I tell you what? I, uh, a few days later, she had surgery, and I took her over for surgery, and we went to the hospital with her, and they let me in. Of course, COVID protocols, it's just one of us there, and I was in there with her. And I tell you, the, we had the most incredible nurse. And she made that experience like complete polar opposite of what we experienced at the hospital. We went in for surgery. It's like she wanted to be there. She wanted to make it as easy as possible for my mom, as easy as possible for me. Uh, she, a completely different experience. Can I tell you something? You want to change your family? You want to change your community? You want to change your church? Get the heart of a servant because the world's going to lie to you. The world's going to lie and say, you got to be great. But honestly, the goal of a Christian is to make Jesus great. One day, you're going to go to a funeral. I've gone to hundreds of them. But this funeral is going to be different than any other funeral you've gone to because you're not going to be alive because it's going to be your funeral. And someone's going to be tasked. And I've sat in a conference room or my office or in a home dozens of times and have done this. Someone's going to be tasked with writing a paragraph about your life that's going to describe your life. And what I will tell you is this, when they write that one paragraph, they're most likely going to leave out all your accomplishments, and they're not going to talk about you being a CEO or your bank account balances. They're not going to talk really about what you've done, but more about who you are. Because you hear a message like this, and the takeaway is going to be, man, I got to sign up, do check, 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 check. No, I'm not talking about more tasks. I'm talking about not doing the servant, but being a servant, having the heart of one. Jesus told us this, and Paul wrote this rather in Hebrews 13 about Jesus. And he said, hey, um, because the world's going to try to trick you and think, think this world is your permanent home. He said, this world is not our permanent home. The world's going to lie to you and say, this is everything there is. That's what it does. There's nothing else past this world. It's lying to you. 
He said, but we're looking forward to a home yet to come, like heaven. He said, because of this, let us offer through Jesus continual sacrifice of praise to God, proclaiming our allegiance to his name. Like it's going to be a sacrifice. He said, and don't forget to do good and to share with those in need. The, these are the sacrifices that please God. What, what pleases God is when you do something for other people. I would say it like this, that if you really love me, if Jesus were here tonight and he was going to sum up this message, I think he would do it like this. If you really love me, because I, I think this, if you really love me, like honestly, you don't have to do nice things for me and buy nice things for me. Because I'll be honest with you, I can, I can buy what I want. But if you really love me, you want to do something? Bless my wife and you bless me. Honestly, you, you, you want to hurt me? You could hurt, throw shots at me. It's okay. I don't really, you know, it doesn't bother me as much. Dina says that's a gift from the Lord, but probably just arrogance. Um, but you want to hurt me? Talk about about my bride. You want to bless me? Bless my kids. You want to bless me? Bless what I love. I think Jesus said, if you really love me, love others.